Welcome to the Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance July program. We are glad you are all here. Um, okay. Um, and it's, um, we're excited to have our esteemed panel with us today. We wanna thank them for attending and also for each of you for taking the time to attend this meeting uh, this morning. And a special thanks to, to those of you who chose the donate option when you registered and made a contribution to TVNPA. We're grateful for your support. And again, I want to thank I want to thank the program committee for working to make this happen. There is always a lot of work going on behind the scenes with volunteers, and we really appreciate your help all the time. Um, and then, before I turn the meeting over to Carolyn to get this meeting started, I'm going to tell you about some of our upcoming programs. First, I'm going to tell you after this meeting this morning, on uh, July 12th, we have a special follow-up program, and it's going to build on today. So today, you're going to learn from some experts in this area. They're going to share their, their knowledge, their information, and you're going to have some great takeaways and be really excited to go out there and get rolling. And then you might go, but what do I do? How do I start? <laughs> well, that's what's going to happen on July 12th. We have our July 20th. 20th. I apologize. Uh, July 20th. And it'll be a two-hour smaller group program with uh, Dr. Lydia Hughes-Evans, and she'll work with you to create to help create the design on really how to how to make that happen. So we do have early bird pricing. It's a, it's a paid program, but it's very moderately priced. And we have early bird pricing through July 12th. That's that date. So I encourage you to check that out. It's up on our website and sign up because space is limited. Um, and then let's see, our August program, I'm really excited about that as well. It'll be on the topic of leveraging donor advice funds for fundraising success. We'll have David Russo from Catholic Charities and Linda Barr from the National Philanthropic Trust. And you'll be able to learn how you can work with donor advice funds to increase philanthropic commitments to your organizations. I know a lot of you are like me and you think they seem like those donor advice funds are unreachable. <laughs> and uh, so, they will share on how you can actually get access to those and how you can um, create planned giving and uh, really engage the donors for those. Then in September, we're excited that we're going to meet together in person at the Bankhead Theater. And this is going to be a celebration of our return to being back and seeing your faces again. And our topic that morning will we'll be featuring you as our speakers. And we'll have some small group breakouts. And one of them is like, what have you learned in this last year that you'll be carrying forward? We have all learned a lot. What is it you're gonna, you've learned that you will be able to apply as we go forward? Um, Kathy Coyle can tell us about the hybrid <laughs> programs. And I look forward to learning about her experience in that because our hope is to go um, be able to host some hybrid programs as we go forward for those of you who aren't able to actually make it in person. And so we can continue to have events with speakers like Jim Taylor, who's over in Arlington, um, Virginia, and who can join us because of Zoom. So we're excited about that. Now, um, it's my pleasure to get this meeting started and turn it over to Carolyn Siegfried, TVNPA's board chair. Good morning, everyone. I am the very proud board chair of the Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance, and I have the privilege of uh, introducing our esteemed moderator and panelists for today's program. Um, so our moderator for today is Dr. Lydia Hughes-Evans, who has 15 years experience walking alongside organizations and individuals on their pathways to success through her breadth of experience in the education, nonprofit and business sectors. She has exercised her entrepreneurial muscles as the founder and CEO of Pure Momentum Consulting for the past 13 years, where she provides hands-on nonprofit management and operations support. She served on the board of directors for World Hope International and has worked in administrative and departmental leadership roles for several nonprofit agencies. Dr. Lydia Evan Hughes has a BA in English and Psychology from Maryville University in St. Louis, Missouri, and her MA in Educational Instructional Leadership and her Doctorate of Education in Organizational Leadership from Argosy University. One of our panelists today is Dr. Renee Rubin-Ross, 
who is a recognized leader on board and organizational development and strategy and the founder of the Ross Collective, a consulting firm that designs and leads inclusive participatory processes for social sector boards and staff. Committed to racial equity in the nonprofit sector, Dr. Ross guides leaders and organizations in strategic plans and governance processes that deepen social change, racial justice, stakeholder agreement, and community strength. In addition to her consulting work, Dr. Ross is the director of the Cal State University East Bay Nonprofit Management Certificate Program and teaches board development and grant writing for that program. Dr. Ross lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with her family. She is a board member of the Alliance for Nonprofit Management her doctorate in education and Jewish studies from New York University explored parent participation in schools. Renee's hobbies include running, hiking, playing guitar, and baking sourdough bread. And joining Renee on the panel today is Jim Taylor. As vice president of leadership initiatives, Jim Taylor leads board sources efforts to position nonprofit boards for stronger leadership on diversity, equity, and inclusion. This includes leading, leading the organization's work to spark and support understanding action and change at the board level on these issues, serving as an external representative, speaker, and writer, developing new resources and programming, and partnering with peer organizations around the country. Prior to joining Board Source in December 2018, Jim held several leadership roles in community development and diversity, equity, and inclusion. As Vice President of Multicultural Leadership, AARP, he developed partnerships to create greater access to health, wealth, and quality of life programs and information for African Americans of age 50 plus. At Capital One, in the roles of Director of Community Relations and Director of Community Development, Jim developed and implemented impactful national and local strategies that leveraged the organization's philanthropic, volunteer, and programmatic resources to serve lower income populations. As Director of Product Innovation at Fannie Mae, he developed several successful first time home buyer programs targeted to multicultural organizations and audiences. And most recently, Jim was the Corporate Relations Program Officer at the Fairfax County, Virginia Office of Public-Private Partnerships, where he was a key member of the strategy team for implementation of the county's racial and social equity policy, One Fairfax. Jim has served on the boards of directors of various local and regional nonprofits in the Metro Washington, D.C. area, including Carpenter Shelter, the Giving Square, the Latino Economic Development Center, the Housing Association of Nonprofit Developers, the Affordable Housing Conference of Montgomery County, Maryland, and Learn Serve International. Jim is from Long Island, New York, and earned an MBA from the University of North Carolina, Kennan Flagger Business School, and an MBA from the University of Virginia. I'm very excited to hear from all of these individuals today, and I turn it over to our panelists, Dr. Lydia Hughes-Evans. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, Carolyn, thank you so much for your warm introductions, and I'd like to personally thank Kathy Young and TVNPA for allowing me to be your moderator today. And Jim and Dr. Renee, I'm so happy to see you and be here with you guys, and what a pleasure. So I'm excited for today. I hope that all of you are as well. Um, so before we jump in, though, I'd like to quickly poll the audience uh, so that we can get a feel for what stage you're in in your inclusive board development so we can really tailor our discussion uh, to be to really meet your needs today. So Kathy is going to pop up that poll right there. And I just saw it on my screen. So hopefully you see it on yours. So that question there is, that where is your board in the process of becoming inclusive? So there's a few options there. So maybe you're just starting out and you're thinking about it. Maybe you're actually out there recruiting uh, diverse board members. Maybe you're onboarding and integrating them. 
or maybe you're like, okay, we got these divorce, do divorce, not divorce, <laughs> these diverse uh, board members, and now we're trying to make this thing work, right? We're kind of grappling with, with integration pieces, or we've been able to kind of go through that level of storming and norming and performing that all teams deal with, and we're actually at operation with our diverse board. So if you could just click right there to see where you are, uh, where your board is, um, and then Kathy, maybe you can uh, share uh, with me or with us, what were those top two states? They're still coming in. Perfect. So give it just a minute. Very exciting. Okay, if anyone else wants to answer, you got, oh, comes another one. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and if I hit end polling, that should show the results, correct? I'm afraid of, <laughs> okay. I'm gonna hit it. Okay, share results. All right, so it looks like a lot of us are at the defining purpose in our strategy and we're an active recruitment. Excellent. I'm just taking a little note here just so I can remember that. All right, thank you guys. This was this was awesome. And this will really help to make sure that what we're talking about today is really speaking to where you are. Um, so let's go ahead and, up and jump in. Uh, just a reminder that we're actually gonna be taking questions after the moderated portion of our discussion today. Uh, so if you're comfortable uh, to use the chat, please feel free to put those questions and comments in there in the meantime. And I know that uh, Carolyn and I will kind of be looking at that towards the end after we do uh, the next portion of our agenda. Uh, so make sure that as things are coming top of mind to you, go ahead and, and stick it in there. Uh, let's go right ahead and hop on in. My job is to try to keep us on time. Cross your fingers, Kathy. All right. <laughs> All right. So um, first question uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, we're going to start with Dr. Renee here. So I'd like to start, uh, and Carolyn did a wonderful job of reading our bios uh, and, and really kind of giving a background, but I want us to get a little bit deeper into kind of how, what, what makes us unique uh, to, to to having this particular conversation. So I'd like to ask you to start by asking you to share a little bit more about your nonprofit leadership and consulting experience when it comes to building an inclusive board. So Dr. Renee, can you share uh, one or two high level uh, takeaways for us? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Good morning. And um, thank you, TVNA, TVNPA, for um, having me here. So I just, I wanted to start by talking about my students at Cal State East Bay. Our students are working professionals. They're entry to mid-level in the nonprofit sector. Although at this point, we do have a, a couple of executive directors going through our, the nonprofit management certificate program also. Um, and our students are really a multiracial rainbow of Black, Latinx, Asian American. Um, and actually, you know, the at this point, the white people are in the, min the minority, probably 20 to 30% of our students. So I, I teach board development and I taught, I was sharing the information that Jim probably has been working, Jim and his people have been working on at Board Source about board composition. Um, and I shared this, I've taught this a couple times. So the first few times we ta I taught this, I just shared the statistics, you know, that um, basically the boards are over, overwhelmingly white and, and between 2017 and 2019, that didn't really shift, even though executive directors and board members know this is a problem. So the first few times it was like, well, here's the problem and that's it. And my students were like, you gotta help me. You gotta, what do we do about this? And so that's where I started to talk about what is one change that we each can make, okay? We don't have to, this is step by step. There is a lot of information about how, what we can do. And, the, and it's just like, get on the train and start making, start helping it to move. So that's really the approach that I take with boards and with my students. And we, there's a million things, and I'm sure we'll talk about them today. Everything from how do you cross boundaries? How do you learn more about race? Understand that we have, we are a racist society that there is systemic racism. Um, embedded in all of this. How do you become an anti-racist if you're a white person or anyone? Um, have, so I'll stop there, but I would say, you know, it's like what for each of you listening today, my hope is that you will think about, and that's really what we're going to be talking about in the small groups, 
what's the one change that I can begin to make to move things in a different direction? That's awesome. That's awesome. And that, that's such an important piece of, I know for all three of us, for what we do as consultants, right? Because it's like, okay, enough with the talking, let's get to the doing, yeah. right? <laughs> so <laughs> let, let's get to the doing. That's awesome. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Jim, yes. tell us about your experience. I know we, we heard all the magic in your bio, but what <laughs> makes you just awesome in this particular area? Wow, well, thank you. And, and again, I, I also want to say thank you to TVNPA for having me back for a second time. I, I was with this group, uh, I think it was last October. So it's great to be back a second time to talk with all of you and, and to be with you, Renee and, and Lydia. It's wonderful to spend time with you again as well. Um, what I would say about my background is that um, you know, I come to this work around diversity, equity, and, and inclusion from a little bit of a non-traditional path. You know, I, I really started, as, as you heard in my bio, I started as really a community development sort of affordable housing person at, at Fannie Mae. That was really the beginning of my career. But I, in retrospect, when I look back at the work I did at Fannie Mae around housing and Capital One around community development and corporate social responsibility and AARP around you know, health and wealth and, and quality of life, looking at disparities that we see between people of color and white people in this country in terms of access to those sorts of quality of life issues, I realize I've been doing this work all along, you know, that, that in fact, um, when we talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity, we're talking about what I'm talking about when I do this work is how do we give, how do we provide access to opportunity to people who have been historically underserved due to all the reasons, all the systemic reasons that we know about. And so um, the work I do now, while it's much more formal diversity, equity, and inclusion, I kind of think everything I've done leading up to this work at Board Source has, has sort of set the stage for me to be able to do the work now across a variety of mission areas that I know are, are even represented in this audience today. Because I think no matter what mission area you're in, all of us want to fulfill our missions and all of us want to, to advance the public good. And I believe, and, and we believe at Board Source, that you cannot fulfill your mission as a nonprofit organization and you cannot fulfill the public good unless you are committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because otherwise, someone's being left out. Someone is being treated inequitably. Someone is being harmed. And I think we're all, all three of us, and, and, I, and I know everyone on this who's chosen to be a part of this conversation, is dedicated to making sure that, that doesn't, that's not the outcome, that, that we achieve this vision off in the distance of a truly equitable society. Um, so that's, that's kind of why I'm, why I do the work I do. It, it's, I kind of feel, of, think of it as not just my job, but also my calling as a person of color who has also personally experienced many of the things that we talk about in, in our society around uh, inequities and um, just experiences where I have been, where someone has tried to make me feel like something less than. And I think it's important for us to, to address those issues and change society in such a way that for the next generation, as we go forward, that some of these inequities, some of these experiences that are so awkward, so um, frustrating, um, can be eradicated so that we have, so everyone, uh, everyone can have the same opportunity to live and work and thrive wherever we choose to do it um, with whatever our identities are. That's awesome. So, so what I'm hearing is that we have to get in there and do something. <laughs> and there's a lot of different ways and approaches that we can come about it. So we don't even, we don't necessarily only need to be DEI experts, but there's a lot of inroads into making that difference. Um, that's awesome. I appreciate that. I know definitely for me, the reason why it matters for me is because I realized in life, I've always been part of somebody's diversity initiative. <laughs> it's like starting from day one uh, that I've been, you know, I've been the, 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 the BIPOC member of something, particularly around trying to make something more diverse. So uh, that definitely is a drive for me as well. This is great. Um, I'm going to ask you to a question that I uh, left out of my script here, but I think it is important uh, for us to do. And so I'm going to ask you uh, really quickly, um, uh, Renee, could you give us a very succinct uh, definition of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? Uh, those three words, I think we probably need to define that for the group. Oh my gosh, yeah. And there's so many different ways that people are now looking at this. Um, I really, so I, um, to my mind, diversity is actually bringing people of diverse backgrounds together, but without, and sometimes without the groundwork to make sure that there's a sense of belonging for each person. 
So personally, I, I understand what diversity is. I mean, you can often see it, although there's also diversity of disabilities and sexual orientation, all of that. But um, I am I work talk with people a lot about uh, racial equity specifically. And two dimensions of that, I can also I can put it in the chat. Systems are shifted so that BIPOC, Black, Indigenous people of color who have been historically and systemic system systematically disadvantaged in terms of access to wealth, power, and health have the resources to enjoy full and healthy lives. So it's shift, shifting systems. And then also the people closest to the challenges have the power to dictate the solutions. So the people who know most about um, what needs to happen are weighing in. That's right. right? That's right. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. That, that was great. Jim, is there anything you would like to add to uh, us defining, since we're going to be talking about DEI and diversity, equity, and inclusion for this conversation, any, anything else we need to add to those definitions while we're thinking about these concepts? Yeah, sure. Just to build on what Renee said, which I totally agree with, um, when I think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, in my role, I think about it as it relates to nonprofit boards in particular. And so what I would say in sort of the context of boards is that diversity we think of diversity in terms of diversity of skill sets, diversity of areas of expertise, racial and ethnic diversity, of course, and also diversity of lived experiences. And, and maybe just for a moment, I'll take a moment to, to share an example of what I think is an, an interesting lived experience uh, related to an experience I had recently. Um, I was on a panel similar to this one with a Latinx gentleman who is a banker at a major bank in, this, in the United States. And uh, he said that, you know, when he sorts on nonprofit boards, he always serves on boards that have something to do with affordable housing. And I asked him why that was. I said, you know, what is it about housing that, that grabs your interest that much? And he said, well, the reason I'm, I always serve on housing boards is because when I was a child, we moved as a family nine times in 10 years. And so when we moved nine times in 10 years, I never, I never got settled. I, I, I never had the sorts of relationships, friendships that I would have had if I could have settled in one place for a long time. I was always a little bit anxious. I, I never quite knew if this was going to be home for a long time or not. And so the lived experience of having gone through that as a child makes him now want to use his experience and his, his capacity now to serve nonprofits that are, that are all about affordable housing, because he knows from his own lived experience, his life is just so proximate to the mission of affordable housing that he, he feels he can add something to any board that's doing work around affordable housing because he has that experience that maybe nobody else on that board has. And so um, that's not to say that every single person on a board will have that sort of experience to bring, but I do think it's an important um, sort of element in the mix, in the composition that you're trying to build with boards to have someone who can really speak to the true impact of the work that you're doing, as opposed to having it be much more perhaps sort of theoretical for other folks who are on that board who have never lived through it, have not had that same lived experience. That's right. That's right. That, that's great. Um, so there's a number of different ways to think about uh, diversity um, and, and equity and inclusion. Once again, a lot of different inroads to be able to get there. But ultimately, uh, Renee, I love what you said about uh, having the people who are most impacted be able to give the most amount of say um, and to have the most amount of say or to have say in, in their experience. Um, that, that's huge. That's great. So uh, let's get into some of the fun stuff. So we all talk about, everybody's talking about DEI. It's like everywhere, right? And it's like, and, and, you know, and it's like, it's, it's, it's obviously it's very important and it's, we're going through a transformational time, I think, in our nation in regards to this. But I mean, why should it even matter? Let's be honest. Like, <laughs> why should DEI even matter to a, a nonprofit board? Why is it even important? So, uh, Renee, can you start us off? Why, why, why should we care? Sure. So, I mean, I think there's, you know, incredible amounts of research showing that diverse teams that build that sense of belonging perform a lot better. Right. So there is, I mean, I know that I actually have a piece of paper from board source <laughs> and it's every single case. There's a social justice case that this is the right thing to do. There's the power case. There's the business case. There's the fundraising case. Um, I think there's no shortage of information about, you know, why this is a good idea. But I, but when I get this question, I really, this is where I start to turn it back to the group and say, you know, why do you, why do you care about this? What, what do you feel like, what, what does it mean for your organization? 
you know, and I would almost, I, I don't know if we have, if we have a chance, like if people could put in the chat, because I'm really curious, you know, why, why, why does it matter to, if anyone has any, any thoughts that they might want to share in the chat, I'd, I'd be curious to, to hear. I think it's definitely, definitely add, add if you have something to the chat. I love that. Um, and I think it's something that we're always kind of thinking top of mind of, right? Not just that people are telling us that this is important, but how do we take ownership of that importance? And I love that question, right? What does that mean to us, right? What does it mean to me? Jim, why, why, why should boards care? You got all the data over there. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. But, but why I, should they care? <laughs> Sure. Uh, as, as Renee was saying, too, I, I do think there are so many different ways you can make the case. And I, I'm drawn to the fact that some people are moved by the data, others are moved by a narrative, and some are moved by a little combination of both, right? And so um, what, I'll, what I'll share today, though, is um, we have a new, a new study um, that we've alluded to earlier already today, Leading with Intent, that just came out a couple weeks ago. And uh, not only do we, do we do our normal leading with intent study that looks at all the different trends and practices in the nonprofit sector, but we did a special sort of supplement that's all about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one of the things we learned this time around the research that I think speaks to this question of why it matters for those individuals who need sort of a really sort of practical sort of explanation is that we found, we found that for those boards that are lacking in racial and ethnic diversity, they self-reported to us that their lack of diversity impacts their ability to understand the organization's operating environment and work, retain and attract talent for board and staff, um, enhance the organization's standing with funders, donors, and the general public, um, and understand how to best serve the community and cultivate trust and confidence with the community that they serve. So when I think about all of those different things that boards are telling us, impact them from the standpoint of their of, of their lack of diversity on, on their boards. The, not only their lack of diversity on their boards, but also the, the, the lack of having an inclusive environment on that board and the lack of an equity focus in how they see their work and how they see the world, then all of those things speak to why it matters. You know, and, and I think um, I was I said earlier, you know, our vision of the sector is of a, of a world where every social sector organization has leadership it needs to fulfill their mission and advance the public good. And if you can't do that, if you're not committed to this work, and that is sort of the philosophical argument. And I, and I hope most people are moved by that. I hope that that catches on. But for those who, are, who, who need something more than that, hopefully these other facts that are sort of self-reported kind of speak to, okay, this affects, this affects you internally and externally in terms of your impact and your, your work. So, you need to focus it and not focus on it and not compartmentalize it as a as a one off sort of concept. That's what we love about um, systems thinking and systems approaches, right? Everything relates and touches everything else. There's no like singular compartmentalized separated part of the system. So the board is a part of the larger or nonprofit ecosystem of the organization. And so what happens at that level takes place and it spreads and it touches all the other levels all the way out to client impact. That's huge. Absolutely. That's huge. Um, so let's, we, we now know where a lot of our, our group are, right? So our audience are basically, um, people are at the strategy, thinking about their approach, how they want to start to get out there and talk to um, and, and connect with diverse board members. And some people are actually out there actively recruiting. So this is where the majority of our, our, um, our audience is at the moment. So Jim, from your perspective, what are some of the most important steps for a board to take at those two, two stages of thinking about becoming more diverse and then actively going out and starting to talk to people in order to build that level of diversity? Yeah, well, I think there are a few things a board should do up front and a few things to sort of remember as, as boards begin to do this work. And, and one of the thoughts that comes to mind for me is that, um, you know, not everyone on your board will necessarily be starting from the same place with regard to this work. Um, if your board is comprised of, uh, of people of different races or different lived experiences, people who've had different exposures, different levels of exposure to people unlike themselves, then um, you might find that your board, you, you may think you're ready to launch into the work, and, but you might also find that not everyone on your board is, is entirely bought in um, to the work. And so one of the things we say up front is that, you know, we've got a series of five questions that we ask boards to ask themselves um, when they're beginning to start this work. And the questions kind of go into um, a discussion of 
whether the board's current composition negatively or positively impacts uh, their perception in, in the community, or if someone knew nothing else about the board but their board composition, what would they be likely to think of that board's values? Um, to what degree is the board bringing in the voice of the community into the boardroom for st strategic discussions? And to what extent does the board ever make decisions without being fully sure of what it is that the community it itself would prioritize and want? You know, those sorts of questions are the things we ask boards to ask themselves pretty early on because we think they can be sort of diagnostics in terms of how, where boards are starting from. Perhaps everyone has a consensus and wants to move forward. Perhaps your board is more divided than that. And, it, and it's good to know that too and have those issues emerge so you can have further conversations. Um, other thing I'll just say too is um, also an understanding that sometimes, I'll just say it, sometimes white people can be defensive when it comes to talking about these issues. You know, I, we, I found in many cases that we talk about issues of, of diversity, equity, inclusion, there is a sense, I've had this happen more than once, where someone in the audience will say, I feel like I'm being blamed for something that happened years before I was born. You know, some, of these, some of these historic incidents of systemic racism are things that happened before I was even born. You know, so why am I feeling so blamed in the moment? And um, the thing I'll just say in closing out this part of my answer to this question is, you know, Isabel Wilkerson just wrote a wonderful book called Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. And she kind of addresses that issue in the book. You know, she talks about the analogy she draws is of a house that's built on sort of um, unstable land. And she says in the book, she says, you know, not one of us was here when this house was built. Our immediate ancestors may have had nothing to do with it, but here we are, the current occupants of a property with stress cracks and bowed walls and fissures built into the foundation. Mm -hmm. We are the heirs to whatever is right or wrong with it. We did not erect the uneven pillars or joists, but they are ours to deal with now. And any further deterioration is in fact on our hands. So for boards that are not there yet, for, for boards that are not prioritizing this work, that's one way to think about this work is to say, no one's trying to blame anyone for things that we weren't here for, but we are accountable for what's, what happens now and going forward. So that's what I would say. I love that, Jim. I, I absolutely love that. Um, once again, time is a continuum, right? So it's not, time doesn't take place in separate non-connected errors. Uh, it's a continuum over time and our experience uh, historically is a, is a continuum of experience over time. Um, so we are impacted by what happened a thousand years ago, literally uh, today. So, wow, that's, that's great. Uh, Renee, what would you add to some of those steps or stages or, or, or mindsets that, that boards can be thinking about when they're at the strategy level or maybe going out at the active recruitment level. Yeah, thank you. And thank you. I want to read Cast. I haven't read it yet, but I've heard such good things. I, this is the part where we talk about books because I actually have one that I want to mention also, which is The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together by Heather McGee. Um, I actually heard her last, I was presenting at the AFP Global Conference and she was one of the keynote speakers and I'm reading her book. Um, and she starts off by talking about, you know, why can, why if we have such a, um, a um, strong uh, gross, pro, you know, gross GNP in the, in the US, why can't we have nice things? And she's like, I don't mean, a, you know, something from a drive through cappuccino, I don't mean a drive through espresso. I mean, why do we not have public health that protects everyone in the United States, you know, from a pandemic? Why do we not have education that is strong for every citizen so we can, you know, prosper and do great work and keep building our country? Um, and she really talks about this, how racism built into the fabric of America is holding us back in all different kinds of ways. And there's one idea that she mentions, which is this idea of the zero sum. And the idea that many white people believe that if we, if white people have less, if there's some more that uh, that people of color get, that white people are going to get less, and that and that actually there's the ev all the evidence is completely against that. Uh, that the, the evidence actually shows that the more that everyone in our society prospers in every dimension, whether it's voting rights or whether it's union salaries, and then the salaries go up or whatever it is that it, this is prosperity for all people, right? But why do I mention the zero sum? Because I see it a lot in the boards that, that I work with. There's a sense of something's, if we, 
if we um, focus on inclusion and diversity, that some power is going to get taken away from us. Things are going to go out of control, and who knows what's going to happen after that, right? And it's like this fear that that some that some historically white-led boards are holding on to. Um, I, it's not necessarily boards that I work with. It's more things that I've heard from my students and other colleagues. Um, but I think that that. Um, I guess I would challenge each of us because I think this zero sum is a really, really powerful idea in in our society that, you know, that if we open up rights to everyone, that there's going to be a loss for white people. And there's been a lot of research, you know, um, there's another book called Dying of Whiteness, you know, that talks about a similar idea. But I think for boards to start working towards some of these, uh, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion is really to step back. From that, from that zero sum idea. I love that. It, it, the, what both of you mentioned, uh, it sounds a lot or reminds me a lot about that kind of the scarcity mindset versus mm -hmm. uh, from abundance perspective, right? So the scarcity side of it is um, if I, if somebody else has, then I, I don't have, right? <laughs> so if you have, I lose. Um, but that, that's not really how it works. I don't. It was, people have been struggling with that sometimes when it comes to money, right? Because it's like, well, if you make more, right, then then that means I have less to make or there's less opportunity for me to make. And it's like, yeah, no, <laughs> there's enough out there for everybody and we're all going to be able to benefit um, from that perspective. But it really starts with that mindset of, of coming from that that perspective of, of scarcity and lack or, or fear, um, which you spoke to very nicely. I love that. So I'm going to combine two questions here because I want to make sure that we stay on time. Um, this is this is some really good stuff. So I'm going to put these two questions together. So if the majority of us are at this kind of thinking about this process and starting to embark on having conversations and recruitment about this process, what are some of the challenges that we could face <laughs> in those two stages? And really, what are some things that we should not do right that boards should not do. Uh, I know that um, in the LinkedIn post and Dr. Brene, you responded very nicely to the person who actually actually said that. Like, I'm excited about this panel, but I hope you also tell people what they shouldn't do. So let's talk about that for a bit. Uh, uh, Jim, I'll start with you there. Well, I'll, I'm smiling because I want to thank Renee for because um, I think in what you're referring to, Lydia, is that Renee linked one of my one of my articles that I wrote a few months ago about this question of how to recruit people of color without disrespecting people of color in the process. And, and I, I, I kind of talked a lot about my own experience of having been a, recruited a couple of times for boards where I felt like I was being disrespected from the perspective that as being recruited by white board members, and when I asked them the question of what, 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 what it was about me that prompted them to reach out to me, they just said, well, we want to become more diverse. And that was pretty much all they said. There was no, no discussion of, well, we want to become more diverse, and we noticed you have a background in affordable housing or corporate social responsibility or nothing about my, anything other than the, my, the racial part of my identity. Nothing else about me seemed to matter. And that struck me as being a sort of a, a flashing red light to not join that, those boards in those two cases, because I felt like if I were to take, accept those board positions, then I would just simply be filling a chair, but I wouldn't be respected. My, my perspectives would not have been heard in the same way. I wouldn't have felt valued in the same way. You know, when we talk about, you know, the, the, the kind of culture we want boards to have, we want them to be inclusive, where there's trust and candor and respect, feeling valued, feeling heard. And I, I was, I was concerned that I wouldn't feel those things. And so that's my, that would be my advice to boards in terms of what not to do. But what to do instead, though, is to say, we want to recruit for diversity, but not just for diversity in terms of, of race, but what are the skill sets that we need, that we've identified? What are the areas of expertise that we need to add to this board? What sorts of access to different networks are we most interested in adding? Um, and we have a tool at board source, a strategic board composition matrix that can help you to determine where your board is today versus where your board wants to be. And once you've determined the difference between those things, that becomes a strategic uh, device for how you recruit. You, you say for the next four positions, on our board, we now know we want someone who, we, we want to add racial diversity in, in those four positions. And we wanna add one person who's got experience running a grassroots nonprofit, someone else who's got experience on social media, someone else who's got experience in advocacy, whatever it is, whatever it is you've determined are the things you need, you know, really hone in on those things while also honing in on 
um, adding more racial and ethnic diversity to your board. So, so that's one sort of takeaway that I would hone in on in terms of really being strategic and thoughtful and respectful in the process. I love that. I love that. Um, um, looking at the whole person, right? Not, not yeah. just the, the color of their skin. Yeah. Uh, Renee, what would you add to that? What are some of the challenges that they, we can face when we're at the strategy spot or the <laughs> spot? Of yeah, website? beyond reading uh, Jim's blog. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's interesting, like I've thought a lot about what do words mean? And so there's these different words, you know, one is inclusion and another one's belonging. So inclusion is like, there's some people that have power and they're including some other people, right? Belonging is much more like everybody comes to the group or each person comes to the group and feels a sense of belonging. So I think that often, sometimes boards are aiming for that inclusion, but maybe they don't know enough about the people that they're trying to include to really understand whether these people who may be, who may be um, different from them are gonna feel a sense of belonging. So that's where I think that groundwork of really um, getting ready to, you know, so that people don't have some of the experience, so that people of color don't have these, the kind of experiences that Jim mentioned. Um, I do, when I, um, when I work with boards, I do, I always do an assessment. I think it's, it's a way of talking about, you know, of, of having objective data to talk about what's working and what, what isn't working and how people feel about that. Um, we also, I'm actually, I'm on the, as, as was mentioned before, I'm in the Alliance for Nonprofit Management Board. We're doing a demographic, even though we're only nine members and we, and, you know, we are doing a demographic survey of our board so we can talk objectively and you know, in really concrete terms about who's on the board and who we want to recruit. Um, and I wrote an essay a while back about you know talking about race and why it's really important for white people to talk about race. When I introduce myself now, I say I identify as a white consultant. You know, I am from everything that I've learned. I understand that people of color are often talking about race a lot, and to not be comfortable talking about race is is for some of those people to feel invisible are not acknowledged by the environment. So um, you can read my essay, which is on my blog. I, I'll link, I can link to it. Um, but, but I think it's like how, you know, there's, I always think of this as both what policies, you know, the structural dimension, what policies, procedures need to be put in place to build, to build equity of all kinds. And then also the relationship dimension, which, you know, I think Jim and Lydia, Dr. Lydia, you've mentioned both of those. You know, you want to be feel connected to to the people in the group and and feel like, wow, I, you know, I, I I'm listening, I'm hearing more about your life and learning about you. That's right. That's right. That relationship piece is, 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 is huge. I'm learning that in life. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. Right. It's like in business. In, in every aspect of life, it's about relationships. And so if we're, if we're struggling to build that, we're going to struggle with diversity and we're going to struggle with everything else. Uh, so that, that really is kind of that core piece. Um, and I'm so yeah, glad. I just, I just wanted to add, you know, one of the questions I have on my board assessment is something like, you know, as a board, we have a good time, you know, and then sometimes people say in board development, they'll say, well, why does this question matter? Who cares? It's like, if your board members are not having a good time, <laughs> especially in the middle of a pandemic, they are leaving your board, you know? Yeah. So you want to feel like, wow, I, I go to this group, people value my presence. Right, and each person who comes wants right. to feel that way. That's right, that's right. There's a such thing as board culture, just like there's org culture, absolutely. So I hope, I mean, I'm having so much fun. I don't know about the rest of you guys on the call, but I'm having a blast here. Um, this is like getting really good. I hope you guys are taking good notes. We want to start to wrap this piece up for you uh, so that we can get to the next part of our agenda here. Uh, so, but right now we've talked about so far about why DEI is important. What are some of, kind of those pitfalls that we can fall into along the way and some of the mindsets we need to be in. So let's get into some next steps. So I'm going to start with you, Jim. Well, what are some of the mindsets or supports that boards need along this journey in general and in those two stages of starting and recruitment, um, wh wh where should we maybe one or two really quick um, pieces of two mindsets or, or thoughts, philosophies, where we should be coming from at that spot? Okay. Um, okay. First mindset is to be courageous in the work. And by, what I mean by that is to, is to not, not shy away from feeling uncomfortable. You know, the discomfort is part of the work. Um, so don't, don't shut down if 
certain terms make you feel uncomfortable. Don't shut down if certain historical facts or even present facts make you uncomfortable. Recognize that that's part, that's part of the work um, that, that we all need to do. And the next thing I would say from a mindset perspective is um, to be, to, to keep learning, really just to keep, stay committed to learning. Um, I didn't mention this earlier, but one of the, there are lots of things that boards can do in terms of chances to learn about this work that helps build their capacity to have better conversations. Things like um, doing the 21 day racial equity habit building challenge, which is a, a great tool that gives you a chance to do something every day, whether it's listening to a, a, a podcast, watching a TED talk, reading an article, but something every day that builds your knowledge and capacity around racial equity. Um, there are lots of great organizations that provide formal board training, you know, Race Forward, Race Equity and Institute, Crossroads, it's just to name a few. Um, those are the sorts of things that boards can do together and have sort of a common experience um, in, in terms of learning. There's some wonderful racial equity glossaries out there as well. And, and I think that's important too, just to have a certain common understanding of terminology. Right. Um, so, so yeah, so I would just say, be courageous and be committed to learning as, as two mindsets that I would, I would add. I love that. Renee, what would you add there? How am I supposed to top that? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, all of that, you know, I always say make this year, I've said make good trouble, you know, like John Lewis, you know, and, and it's like, all right, um, our vision, it, there is, I mean, I really, this, there is some, we're going to need, there's some pushing that needs to happen. This is culture change. So I, I always advise, you know, for every process, what's your why? Why do you care about this? Maybe, you know, it, it may be because um, you know that your organization is going to work a lot better when you have, um, when you have pr the perspectives of people, more perspectives of people who are closer to the problems. It may be, you know, th whatever your why is, it may be because your neighbor, because you know that your neighbor's story and you feel like that needs to be incorporated in everything you're doing going forward, whatever it is. That, um, I think that why is really the energy for, for making change because we are talking about change. Right. Um, I think, you know, it's, uh, this is, I, we talk about, you know, it's, we, we live in a society that has taken 400 years to get to these issues, you know, to struggle with slavery and wealth differential and all of that. And it's going to take a while. So we, we need to have the stamina to keep mm. going and keep pushing through all of this. Um, and I agree with Jim, you know, I, as a facilitator and someone who knows a lot about this, I keep deepening and learning. I think we all need to um, just keep, keep learning and then keep it, but also say, okay, I'm not gonna just leave it at the learning place. What are the actions that we can take as, yes. as individuals and as group? One more thing I would add is I think, so I really wanna call out that, um, that for white people, it is our responsibility not to depend on people of color to educate us. You know, that, that we should know, I think there's sometimes an idea that the person of color comes on the board and they're gonna be talking about race. No, that's not the way, you know, really everyone in the group, it, there's some responsibility for individual learning. I love that. So this is what I heard. We need to be courageous. We have to keep learning. We have to make good trouble. I love that, Renee. I'm going to probably steal that. I love that. We need to be clear on what our why is. We need to have stamina because this is a marathon and not a sprint. Um, and we need to be, we need to embrace our learning, right? Uh, for ourselves, own our own learning, um, everybody to own their own learning. I love that. So I'm going to wrap this up because Kathy's probably going to kill me because I think I'm like a minute <laughs> or two over where I should be. So last question, and we're just going to um, add, add one step here. So if a board is trying to become inclusive, but they don't know where to start, or they may have gotten stuck somewhere along their journey, what's one thing that that, that they could do well, really succinctly. Uh, Renee, I'll start with you. Um, I think it's, you know, it's that reflection piece mm. of, of where are we in the journey? So, you know, there's, you're not alone. There are a lot of other people and boards are going on this journey with you. I think it would be reflection piece. Where are we? And then do we internally have the resources or, or do we need to have, you know, potentially have a consultant come in and work with us to support us on on this journey, um, but there's a lot of you know both. Like and um, when I talk about any kind of planning, 
there's what you can do internally in the kind of small version, and then there's bigger versions. So kind of thinking about what your needs are. I love that. Being honest with our, our capacity, right? That's that. That's awesome. Uh, Jim, what what uh, we're stuck or we don't know where to start, what should we do? Um, I, I like what Renee said about reflection. And I would say reflecting on how inclusive your board is right now as it relates to how you bring on new board members. So um, how do you welcome them? How do you give them a detailed orientation? Do you assign a mentor or buddy for your new members? Do you, and as you're, as you're recruiting more diverse members, are you also making sure that to, to that point I was making earlier around sort of tokenism in terms of people feeling like they were just being brought on for their race, are you bringing on new board members and putting them on committees to, to show that, hey, we're bringing you on because of the expertise that you bring? Um, and from a social inclusion perspective, as we talked about social inclusion earlier, Renee, you mentioned, are we having fun as a board? Um, I think that's an important one too. Like, to what degree are you making sure that your social, social practices are inclusive um, so that everyone can join in, everyone will have fun, that you're not doing things that some board members can do, but other board members are not available to do. Right. So thinking about inclusion in all those ways, in terms of those sort of practical ways in which inclusion manifests itself or doesn't, um, and, and change those things that, that are not inclusive, but, but reflect on them and, and really take a hard look. Taking that internal look internally and reaching out to, to get help if you need help uh, and being, being honest about that and being okay with reaching out for help, right? Because we're all learning this together. So I don't know about you guys, but like I said, I had fun. If y'all didn't know well, uh, but this has been a powerfully great, wonderful discussion today. I hope you gained as much as it from I have. Um, and I want to thank my illustrious colleagues again for sharing their time and wisdom with us today. Uh, Dr. Renee of the Ross Collective and Mr. Jim Taylor from Board Source. I can't thank you both enough. This has been way fun. Um, and thank you to everyone who's tuned in to listen. We wouldn't be here without you guys. I mean, this is why we're here. So <laughs> um, thank you. And Kathy, I'm going to turn it over to you so that we can uh, move forward with our agenda. Okay, so we're gonna go into breakout rooms, correct? And so sure. I'm gonna assign you, um, and I'm going to do, let's see, nine breakout rooms and ready, um, here you go. And the topic for the discussion is in the chat. Um, so hopefully you can pick a leader for each room who can um, collect as much information as possible. And then when we come back, we'll have you report out and um, we'll have one person, hopefully from each group, do a quick, short, um, quick report out. Sure. So this is uh, the point. And Kathy, how many different breakout groups did we have? Um, I think we had, no, I think eight, eight. Eight. Okay. So we probably have time to have four or five uh, people kind of report out kind of at the high level. Uh, a minute to no more than two minutes each of what um, they learned from and what they found in uh, kind of answering those questions for what did you find to be significant and what are you going to do? You know, what are some of the things you're going to do in the next couple of weeks? So why don't we start by using the kind of raise your hand feature in if everybody is familiar with that, because then it will show up on your participant list if there would be somebody from one of the breakout groups that would like to start with that uh, and kind of share what you took away from your discussion. And then I would have to be get back into gallery view so I can see if people, okay, so uh, Valerie. I'll kick it off. Um, I was, uh, in the group with Christina from HERS and Charlene from um, TVC. So we uh, talked about what some of our big takeaways from today. Um, great discussion. Um, we talked about the uh, inclusion versus belonging and found that very powerful. Um, and the, that um, it is something that we need to pay a lot of attention to with our board members. Um, so that was one big takeaway. Uh, also, the comment um, about if we're not diverse, we're not really serving the whole community because uh, it's leaving voices um, uh, away from the table. And that's a good, a good uh, way to think about why diversity is important. Um, 
And then uh, the why, the why we're doing this is really important to identify for our board members um, and to talk with them about that. Um, and the, the other thing that really struck us was uh, the concept of zero sum that uh, this is this is a very powerful concept that's being played out around us politically and in all kinds of uh, places and that uh, zero sum really hurts everyone um, drastically. So those were some of the big things that struck us from the conversation. And some of the next steps are um, that uh, it's been a very challenging year and some of us, uh, I, I made this comment, some of us have not had time to work on board development and this needs to come back on the front burner after a year of a pandemic that's absorbed everyone's energy. Um, and then other comments were that uh, it's a great opportunity in the next couple of weeks to talk about creating a, uh, this movement with the board chair and a uh, meeting will be set up with board chairs to do that. Um, and that uh, TVC will have an incoming new ED. And at that point, um, the 21 day equity challenge uh, that, that uh, Jim has um, shared um, in the past uh, uh, would be something to share with the, the new ED. And that's probably over time, but that's all the stuff I got. Okay, great. Thank you, Valerie. And next, uh, Amy. Thank you. So I was with Graham, Layla, and Pat, and it, you know, it was really interesting. We all have very different organizations, and so I think um, the work shows up a little bit differently for us. I mean, I was sharing that we're a women's organization, and I'd love to see men on the board. And Layla was sharing that they're a Filipino organization, and they'd love to have, you know, diversity there. So Graham was sharing he was the only man who's who is attending board meetings on a regular basis. So I think what we all really share and align on is that this was really helpful in helping us think about how to move the work forward, looking at diversity through a multifaceted lens, that it's not just checking a box of race or ethnicity, but it's looking about skill set. It's I think the lived experience piece um, for our organization is really huge. And so I really appreciated um, the value of adding that in. Um, and, you know, I think it's um, just over the last few months, our board has been talking about uh, doing this work and, you know, we're committing to anti-racism work at the board level. We've been doing it at the staff level for a few years. And um, so I think uh, the other things I think we agreed on is you know, the advice to just keep doing it. The work is really, really hard, but show up and commit. Um, and so, you know, our takeaways is, you know, I'm gonna synthesize my notes from today and uh, share with the board chair and vice chair um, in hopes that we can talk about next steps. And, you know, and I also think that um, recognizing that sometimes this work can be done internally and ED and a board and a staff and sometimes we need outside resources and so I think the other thing um, for me that I take away from all of this is that we might need some professional help from people who are trained in this who can come in and really help us move this along so again uh, thank you so much and our group really enjoyed this. All right, you're welcome. And then any other before we move to the uh, open Q and A, uh, somebody from one of the other groups who had something else that they really something that was different that they took away from this discussion or that they're going to put into action in the next two weeks. Uh, so, uh, Genevieve, thank you, Carolyn. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, I was in a group with uh, Shake and Elise, and I wanted to welcome Elise from uh, Illinois. She's uh, clocking in from the Midwest, so that was great. And um, all of us have had experience with uh, either being challenged with not enough diversity in our leadership experiences, or we've been working for years towards uh, a more inclusive space for leadership so that we can represent the diverse people that we actually serve. So I work I'm on the leadership for Head Start and Elise is working with special needs um, students in a uh, performance capacity. Shake has years and years of experience. 
one of the things that really stood out to me was how do we arrive in our leadership positions and be genuine about our, um, our intent. So when we come to be, be leaders, we're not only guiding the organization and the steps that we need, need to make, but we're also being um, representatives of our organization and being in a leadership position that inspires people to lead with more diverse and more equal uh, approach. And that genuineness really stood out to me. Um, and uh, the other thing is, is that maybe we need to put together some action plans. So for addressing the second question, is let's address what we think the needs are and then let's put together an action plan. We can think about a lot of things, but doing them is a whole nother ball game. And so uh, each of us, I think, took the takeaway that we would go back and look at our experiences and then look at our needs and put together an action plan. So I wanna give us time so that you have an opportunity to ask questions of um, the great presenters we had here today. So if you have an opportunity that you'd like to kind of use the raise your hand function or put in the chat, what really, as we were going through the presentation that uh, Dr. Hughes Evans so skillfully moderated today, and then when Jim and Renee were saying things, what question did you have? Uh, Denise. Hello. Um, in our group, we talked about a lot about the um, lived experience of people we want to rec recruit, especially uh, for my organization. I work for Open Heart Kitchen, and we've always wanted to recruit a board member that was a former recipient of our programs or has faced food insecurity. And um, our board is pretty diverse uh, gender wise and experience in terms of skill set. Uh, but that's the missing piece of the puzzle. So um, I guess my question is about how do you recruit to be more inclusive and accessible? Um, if you have this traditional nominating committee process of mostly white board members on that nominating committee? Is there another process to do recruitment in a way that's uh, inclusive and accessible. Well, I would say first, the um, I'm glad you mentioned the nominating committee because I think that's an important point that we, we haven't really talked about today. And that is that um, when you have a nominating, and a lot of organizations have a nominating and governance, governance committee that are the same, they're sort of combined. And that nominating committee is making, is leading the recruitment of a lot of organizations. And so to have represent, to have a diverse representation on that nominating committee uh, is is important if you have if you have that capacity within your board composition as it is today. Just having a diverse ha having someone from a diverse perspective be on that nominating committee can be important because otherwise you run the risk of having a nominating committee that is so rooted in tradition in terms of how your board has always recruited, um, how your board has always evaluated candidates that they might miss out on someone who isn't is not like. The traditional candidate you've had, but might add just that special ingredient that you that you need. So, you know, one of our going back to our board source data for a second. You know, we just came out with a new study that shows that 78% of board members are white, and 19% of boards do not have a single person of color on them. Um, and so, what we see is that a lot of boards will say, "Well, who do we already know? You know, who do we already know who we, we can bring onto the board?" And if you think of it that way, very often you're going to choose someone who's a lot like you, you know, someone who um, is not perhaps not racially diverse, who's going to have similar sort of perspectives on issues, similar socioeconomic background, just more of the same. And so one of the ways that a nominating committee can be different is to post a board position on a website and use diversity focused language in that posting work with local chapters of national professional civic and ethnic associations like the local chapter of the national black mba association the local chapter of the hispanic national bar association um, those sorts of national organizations that have local chapters in every state um, engage the board engage the staff you know staff might be in meetings where they meet someone and think wow that person is from another organization wow, they'd be wonderful for our board you know have, have staff sort of be on the lookout and then have every single board member 
every single board member of, of any race be challenging themselves to think about how they can expand their own network so they can help to build a, a pipeline of candidates at least that's diverse for your for your board to consider over time as people turn off as different openings come up those are some ways that i would say um, that boards can really be, build a different culture in terms of how they recruit and how they can be more inclusive in the process so Jim, as a follow-up to that, and those were great uh, suggestions of really thinking outside the box and thinking outside the box that we live in. Um, and if De for Denise specifically and for other human services organizations that want to recruit somebody who's been served by them, those people are going to have very different life experiences and maybe very different educational levels. Are there kind of other barriers that boards need to take down and, and remove to make that a more inclusive and uh, belonging environment? Yeah, great question. And I would say this comes to a, an issue that we believe in at BoardSource that I'll share with all of you. And I'll share it in, in the context of saying that not every board agrees with us, but I'm gonna share you with, with our philosophy. And one of those barriers that you speak of, um, Carolyn, is um, the barrier of a, of a give or get policy, um, where, as you say, if someone has been a recipient of programs they may not be in a financial position to give at the level that your board may have set, to give or get at the level that your board may have set um, as its policy. And we believe at BoardSource that um, your give or get policy should not be a litmus test for someone who could to, to be able to be on a board or not. That in fact, there shouldn't be a single number. Let's say, let's say your board has a, has a policy of saying that everybody's got to give, give or get $5,000 a year. Well, if you've got someone on your board who's a senior vice president of a corporate you know, a Fortune 500 company, for that person, they could probably give more than that, you know? And if you're so, but you cannot have that same board, you might have someone who works 20 hours a week, who was a former program recipient of the organization, who's, who's kind of just getting by financially, for that person, $5,000 is just not feasible. Um, what we say is that everybody should participate, you should have 100% participation, but people, but board members should give at a level that is personally significant, personally meaningful to them. So that number is going to vary based on your each of your board members' situations, but you shouldn't be in a position where someone, if we, if we talk about Denise's board for a second, um, someone might be a wonderful board member from the perspective of the lived experiences they would bring. It might bring all other sorts of attributes, but just can't meet that financial threshold. That would be a, a, a bad thing for the organization and for that individual. That individual could, could give so much and the board would benefit so much, but they're missing out just because of one this one financial barrier that we don't believe should be in place. So we, we actually think that's, we think that is inequitable in, in and of itself. Um, so that's what I would hone in on in terms of a barrier that should be removed so that everyone has, an, has access to potentially be on that board. And then one of the other questions that kind of uh, came from the chat, and this can be from uh, any of you was Jim had mentioned, you know, do, some daily work to change our habits. And a part of that ongoing learning was the 21 day equity challenge. Uh, is that something that we can just Google and find that resource? I think it was kind of a, a if I remember seeing it kind of a uh, Google doc that people could use. Is that something that, or is there a direct resource that somebody can put in the chat for that? Yeah. I don't love to say I put it in earlier, but I'll put it back in again now because um, you all may not have seen it because I know we went out to breakouts after that, but mm. I'll find it again and, and put it in the chat now. I Great. just wanted Thank to um, give one more response um, and just say, you know, I think just kind of building on everything that Jim said, I think this really does go to strategy. You know, you're, you, if you have, okay, what are we trying to do as an organization? We are trying to really serve our clients so well. And so your board recruitment then reflects that strategic priority, right? It's not just like, oh, well, we're just coming up with names so because we need to fill positions on the board. But it's really like, how can we do our best work? Okay, we can do our best work by embrace, you know, by embracing, um, equity on our board and that also stepping back from that that this is going to require some culture shift so that we're more aware of how we're operating how the conversations are going and that everybody who's coming to these meetings again just going back to that idea of belonging um but yeah that that this is really valuable 
And and you know, and again, this this is all about like alignment. You know, this is where we're. This is the direction we're trying to swim, and that board recruitment piece is supporting that. So, Renee, maybe that's related to the question that Crystal had in the chat, and that was really about there's a board culture that gives privilege to size of gifts. Uh, any yeah. comments on that? Oh, and I want to welcome, this is my colleague, Crystal Cherry, also a very esteemed <laughs> and knowledgeable person. Actually, we met. Um, she did a webinar for Bloomerang a while back on board composition. So we can learn from all of her, too. <laughs> we could all learn from her, too. Um, and we are actually, two of us are, are doing a DEI uh, project for a local board. Um, or we're, we're the facilitators. Um, I think that, you know, that this kind of, again, goes back to the values. If you say we value equity as an organization and we are serving our community, then um, we might ask for every board member to give a meaningful gift, but that doesn't, that is not a, a $5,000 minimum or $10,000 minimum or whatever it might be. And Crystal, I want to throw it back to you because <laughs> I'm sure you have some ideas. Go ahead. Tell us what, <laughs> how do you handle this? No, I threw out the question because I'm a recovering fundraiser and I remember <laughs> when I was on the front lines of fundraising, you know, if, if, a, if a donor or a board member called who was a major donor who was giving us big bucks, we all fell over each other trying to make sure that we accommodated, oh, that's, you know, that's Jim on the phone, somebody take that, you know, we can't let that one go to voicemail or we have to make a priority to call that person back because he gives us $50,000. And, you know, I, so I remember in real life, I mean, we know what we say on paper, you know, everyone, everyone is valued equally and all that kind of good stuff. But if a major donor calls or if a board member who's given a lot of money calls, they get they get preference and, and privileges that, you know, or we have to sit them at the front table. You know, we got to put Jim at the front table with the, with, the, with the sponsors. We can't put him in the back. And so that is, you know, my question in terms of, when you talk about give or get and trying to have everyone make a meaningful donation, the guy who's given a hundred dollars may not be treated the same as the guy who's given fifty thousand dollars. And so, I just wonder how we handle that. Um, yeah, with, and I think that that's a, will be a good reflection question. Uh, I want to pass this back to Kathy because we're coming right up to the end. But I think we all have to think about that in our cultural shifts. And Kathy, we're going to have more discussion about this that you're going to talk about an opportunity to go deep, take a deeper dive into this conversation. I think, thanks, Carolyn. And thanks to everybody who participated and stayed through. I noticed we dropped off when we had um, breakout groups, but I appreciate everybody who has stayed through the end. And what a great program. And um, I love, Carolyn, you ending on the reflection point. Um, I did post in chat one more time our program that we have on uh, the 20th this month that will be working uh, with Lydia in which she'll be leading like how do you actually now that we have this information what are some of the steps that we can take with our organizations to uh, move forward in this area um, as I think somebody mentioned I'm <laughs> forgetting who it was um, some of us might need to have professional help but this is a good way to get started, to get some tools to go forward. And, and uh, so we hope that you will join us in early bird uh, cost. If you're like a member, it's $35. I mean, where can you, where can you get a program like this with um, Lydia for that amount of resources? Anyway, thank you again. Um, we hope you will join us next month at our uh, free monthly program where we will be talking about donor advice funds. So everybody have a really great day and, um, Thank you for showing up.